before we begin our journey on the life and teachings of Jesus, I'd like to just pay tribute to a couple of my professors who made a profound impact upon my life, Dr. Daniel Augsburger and uh, Dr. Raul Dederen, whose uh, godly life and, and careful teaching strongly influenced both the content and the method of this class. So I want to thank them. And most of all, I want to thank Jesus because without him, we wouldn't have anything to say. And uh, I'm looking forward to singing that song recorded in Revelation, Blessing and Honor and Glory and Power be to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever. So I'd like to just pray with you as we begin our journey that uh, Jesus would be honored and the Spirit of God would help us to understand what we're studying. Our Father in heaven, thank you that we can begin now a journey, a study of the life and teachings of Jesus. I thank you for those who have uh, recorded the sacred testimony and for the Spirit of God who protected that testimony and can be with us from day to day now as we begin to study the record. Please open our minds, give us a spirit of wisdom, and may miracles happen in our lives as we listen to your word and receive it with an open heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're about to study the most significant individual in human history. Some people believe he was the Son of God. Others believe he was a holy man, a great prophet. Some people believe he was uh, deluded and deceived. But no one can ignore him. His life divides history in two. And this first lecture, if you want to write down the title, is called The Study of the Life of Jesus. This is lecture one, The Study of the Life of Jesus. And I want to give you a brief introduction about gospel history before we go to major section one. Gospel history is important for the Christian because Christianity is based upon a historical event. Christianity is not simply based upon some uh, sacred teachings, but it's based upon an event in history. And that's why studying about gospel history is very important. Let me give you an illustration which I'll ask you about tomorrow. You've heard of Islam and Muhammad, the the prophet of Islam. Well, let's just say that Muhammad never existed. Now, I'm sure the followers of uh, Islam would not be happy with that. But let's just say that Muhammad never existed. Let's just say uh, about uh, the 10th century some sacred, uh, some holy people got together and gathered some sacred teachings and said, we'll ascribe this to a mythological figure, call him a prophet of Allah. What difference would that make to Islam? Well, I want to suggest to you that it would not make any uh, essential difference because Islam is based on teaching, upon the Quran, upon an understanding of who Allah is. But if Jesus never existed, follow me now, if about the 5th century AD, some church fathers got together and they said, you know, we need to, to have a more holy way of living, let's kind of create a mythological figure, call him the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, and uh, we'll kind of gather some teachings together and you know, kind of fake the record. What difference would that make to Christianity if Jesus never existed? Anybody? Exactly. If there is no Jesus, if it's just love your neighbor as yourself, or even someday the world's going to end, or even there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, if there is no Jesus... If there's no gospel history, if it was just made up, then we have no Savior. And, and as the Apostle Paul said, we're dead in our sins. We might as well just pack up now and go home. It's meaningless. Our life is meaningless. Christianity is nothing. It isn't just a collection of good ethical teachings. It's based upon a person. Jesus the Christ who came into history, and as we'll study, 
He came as our Savior. He took our place. If He didn't exist, He didn't take your place. You don't have a Savior, and we're all in real trouble. So I want you to notice that there's an essential difference between Jesus Christ to Christianity and Muhammad to Islam. Gospel history is important because Christianity is based upon a person in history. So where do we go to learn about gospel history? And here we come to major section one. And I'm using a word perfect type outlining, so this would be a good way to take your notes. And we're going to look, first of all, at biblical sources. Where do we go to learn about this person, Jesus, who is called the Christ? Major section one, biblical sources. Now, within the biblical sources, there's a smaller collection of books that focuses in great detail upon the life and the teachings of Jesus. What do we call that small collection of books? The Gospels, okay? So the Gospels are our major source of information about the life and teachings of Jesus. And we divide those Gospels, as you'll discover in Lectures 2 and 3, into two sections. The Synoptic Gospels... which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we'll talk about what that means uh, in Lecture 2. And then the Gospel of John, which has some significant difference, brings a lot of new information, and I believe a new perspective about the life and teachings of Jesus. But if we were not to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we would have very little information about Gospel history. So that is our primary source. Section B, where is the next important source of information outside of the Gospels about the life and teachings of Jesus? Who, who else talks about the life and teachings of Jesus? Well, of course, the prophets. And we'll look, first of all, at a New Testament apostle, the Apostle Paul. The second major source of information about the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Was the Apostle Paul uh, one of the twelve apostles? No, okay. Did the Apostle Paul ever meet Jesus Christ? Well, you say, it depends, right? He didn't meet Jesus Christ that we know of before the death and resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus appeared to the Apostle Paul when, when Paul was on his way, then called Saul of Tarsus, on his way to the city of Damascus. And Saul records how he's struck down by this brilliant light. <clears throat> Who are you, Lord, he says. And the response is, I am Jesus. So he has an encounter on the Damascus road with the risen Christ. And Paul records that his information about the life and ge teachings of Jesus comes through special revelation. He was not an eyewitness. He wasn't one of the twelve. But he did have at least that one and maybe more encounters with the risen Christ. And an example in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a reference you don't have to write down, but you may have heard of it where in connection with the communion service, he says, I received of the Lord what I also delivered to you on the night Jesus was betrayed. He broke bread. You remember that text? He said, I received that of the Lord. Was, was Paul in the upper room that night? No. But by special revelation, information is given to him about the life and teachings of Jesus. So that's the second major source of biblical information and maybe we should put this word because you might see it on a quiz or test we call that inspired that is God breathed information so we've got the gospels we've got the writings of the apostle Paul and thirdly a third source of information is the 
agrafa. Now let me give you a definition and then I'll give you an example of one of these sayings. The agrafa, grapho in Greek means to write, uh, meaning not written or more spoken, and not written at least as the definition goes. These are sayings of Jesus not written in the Gospels. Okay, you want to write that down. The agrafa are the sayings of Jesus not written in the Gospels. Remember the Gospels are a primary record. But much, even the Apostle John says, you know, if we tried to write down everything that had been written, there wouldn't be room enough to contain it all. So these are just a few thoughts about the life and teachings of Jesus. But there were obviously many sayings of Jesus that were not written down in the Gospels, and many that were not written down at all, right? Let me give you an example of one of these sayings, one of these agrafa, sayings of Jesus, which are not recorded in the Gospels. If you want to write the reference down, it's Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. If you have a red letter edition of your Bible and you're reading through the book of Acts, it kind of jumps out at you there in chapter 20. Wow, red letter. And uh, the Apostle Peter is speaking and he says, As our Lord himself has said, now you perhaps have not read Acts 20 recently, but you've heard this. It's a famous saying of Jesus, but it's not recorded in the Gospels. It's one of these agrafa, okay? As our Lord himself has said, I'm going to start it and you finish it, okay? It is more blessed to give than to... You say, well, that's famous. I thought that must have been in the Gospel of John, right after God so loved the world, you know? No. Nope. It's one of these sayings, and, and there's discussion as to other places in the New Testament that may actually be sayings of Jesus being quoted by the, the New Testament writers. But there's an example of one, a saying recorded in other parts of the New Testament, but not recorded in the Gospels. And then, as uh, one of you mentioned, fourthly, you mentioned about prophets. Well, we've also got the OT, short for Old Testament, prophecies. Give us information about Gospel history, or at least validate what we learn about the life of Jesus. Now, obviously, they don't mention Jesus by name, but there are some clear identifying uh, characteristics of Messiah which are fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Let me just give you a couple you might want to write down. Micah 5 and verse 2 says that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5 and verse 2. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. A startling message that Messiah would take an interest in the people of Galilee. And they were considered to be separated from the blessings of God, especially during the time uh, when Jesus was on the earth. But we'll discover that Jesus did indeed take a special interest in the people of Galilee. Another prophecy, Zechariah, the book before Malachi, Zechariah 9 and verse 9. You don't need to remember any of these references, but... Here another illustration. The daughters of Zion should rejoice greatly. Your king comes to you lowly and riding upon a donkey. And that, when they saw that, even though they didn't know what kind of Messiah Jesus was, when they saw that during the life of Jesus, they began to sing the Messianic Psalms, the Psalms about Messiah. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They started waving palm branches because they knew this prophecy. Your king comes riding on a donkey. So there were many Old Testament prophecies which pointed uh, to Messiah and we see them under this umbrella of biblical sources which give us information about gospel history. Major section 2. Let's look now at sources outside the Bible. And begin with Christian authors. Let's begin with Christian authors. We're now looking at uninspired or non-inspired material. Okay? This is not inspired material. This is not what we would consider uh, scripture. 
And you say, well, then how do we know if it's reliable, if it's not inspired? And the answer is, uh, there are many things that are written which give reference to historical events that may have some difficulties with them, but you read an article talking about a problem that's happening between uh, some leaders in the Middle East, and you may not agree with all of the discussion, but to suggest the leaders don't exist and there's no such place as the Middle East is a little difficult. There's a historical witness there about something happening, all right? So even though this isn't inspired material, it gives us some material to think about in terms of gospel history. The major Christian authors we refer to as the church fathers. These were leaders of the various Christian communities who wrote, and many of their writings were preserved. One scholar a man by the name of John Bunyan, like uh, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, has cataloged references uh, in these church fathers, and he's cataloged references to the New Testament, many of them to the Gospels, 86,000 references. Now, you don't have to remember that. You say, wow, it's hard to say the New Testament didn't exist when they were writing, or the Gospels or Jesus, because the New Testament constantly is referring to Jesus and who he was and what he taught, that he's coming back again. That's the major prophecy of the New Testament, the second coming of Jesus. You don't talk about that if Jesus never came the first time. You've got these 86,000 references in the writings of these church fathers about Jesus and about the apostles and the teachings of the church. Some of these church fathers are people like Origen, Clement, Justin Martyr, and a later one you may have heard of, Augustine. So uh, these are leaders of the church. You don't need to know their names. But they were leaders of Christian communities who wrote about the things that they had learned. A second uh, category under Christian authors are what we call the apocryphal gospels. Let me give you a definition of those and then an example. The apocryphal gospels. These are, these are supposed gospel records which were not accepted by the Christian community as authentic. There are about 25 of them that are mentioned by ancient writers. They were credited to apostles, and so they have names like the Gospel of Andrew, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas. These writings, though, are filled with strange and, uh, sayings, and, and many of them kind of seems so different from the inspired record, you wonder, well, what would be any value in even looking at them? But while they're not inspired, they certainly do give us an awareness that people knew about Jesus and, and maybe even wanted to fake a reliable document. Say, well, I'm going to pretend I'm Thomas, you know, and I'm going to write something and add it to the literature about the life and teachings of Jesus. Here's a couple of examples uh, from the Gospel of Thomas, which while you may look at them and go, huh, I don't think they got that right, certainly shows an awareness that Jesus existed and that he taught. Here's one uh, of the sayings. Uh, it says, The kingdom is like a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. You say, hey, I remember that. Doesn't Luke talk about the shepherd with a hundred sheep? But the Gospel of Thomas uh, changes direction here. One of them, the biggest, went astray. He left the 99 others and looked for this single sheep until he found it. After taking this trouble, he said to the sheep, I love you more than the 99 others. Now you read the Gospel of Luke and that's not the point of the parable at all. If, if anything, it's to say, even though you're just one, you're precious to God, right? Right? And the shepherd goes and looks and finds you. He's not the biggest one, and he's not loved more than anybody else. But, so you say, nice try, whoever wrote that. Didn't quite get the details right. And then there are some things that we just don't hear in the rest of the Gospels that, that Thomas comes up with, or whoever wrote this uh, pseudo-Gospel. His disciples say to him, you imagine this being read from your church this weekend, okay? On what day will you appear, and what, when will we see you? And Jesus says, when you strip yourselves without being ashamed. Okay? <laughs> when, you take, when you take off your clothes, 
and lay them at your feet like little children and trample on them. This is deep theology. When you, then you will become children of him who is living and will have no more fear. Don't even think about what church would look like after that scripture reading was read. But uh, you go, whoa, that's kind of strange stuff. And people who read these apocryphal gospels go, yeah, okay. Well, but obviously someone's wanting to say something and perhaps add to the volume of material rejected by the early Christian community, guided by the Spirit to say, this isn't an inspired record. I don't know who wrote this, by the way. I don't believe it was Thomas. But it does let us know at least that this person is believing that Jesus was there and having some bits of information about who he was. Section B, classical authors. We've looked, section A, at Christian authors, and we've looked at two categories. Now, section B, classical authors. And when we begin to look at classical authors, and I'm going to look at section C, at Jewish authors, we, we immediately come to a problem. Does anybody know what the problem is? When we come to look at classical authors, material about the life and teachings of Jesus. There is very little information in classical authors, contemporary authors, about the life of Jesus. That has led some people to say, well, maybe it didn't exist. Maybe it did get made up later. But we're going to discover there's so much to give us reliability for the gospel record. So why is there so little in the classical writing? Well, I want to share with you my perspective. We'll have to ask when we get there. Say, Jesus, what happened back then to all of that material? Undoubtedly, stuff was written. But I want to tell you, from my understanding of the scripture, there's one thing that Satan hates. It's the truth about who Jesus is. And I believe that Satan has done everything that he can. In fact, he even tried to get rid of the Bible. But to eradicate the testimony about Jesus, who he was, and what he came to do. But he ran into a major problem when he came to inspired writings. And the major problem was the Holy Spirit, who had inspired the prophets to write, preserved it. So that you can have a reliable testimony today. But I think with these classical writings, there was much that Satan was happy to eradicate. I think there was much more written than we have. But here's one little fragment, and you will want to know about it tomorrow. you say, yes, sir. I'll know about this Roman historian by the name of Tacitus, uh, who has an interesting comment about the life of Jesus. He's a Roman historian, first century, around 61 to 117 AD. You don't need that date, but it's first century. And he writes about uh, Nero's burning of Rome. You remember the Rome burned? Early Christians were blamed for that. But I want you to notice here a reference to Christ in this record by Tacitus. Roman historian, first century. In order to suppress the rumor... What was the rumor about the burning of Rome? That Nero had actually burned Rome, okay? But in order to suppress that rumor, Nero falsely accused and punished with most acute torture persons who already hated for their shameful deeds were commonly called Christians. In other words, Tacitus says, he put the blame on Christians and said, Christians are responsible for the burning of Rome. And here comes the reference now about the Christ. The founder of that name, Christus, that's Latin for Christ, and Christ is Greek for Messiah in the Hebrew, so we're talking about Jesus the Christ. Christus had been put to death by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Is that what we know about the Gospel record? Yep, okay. In the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Well, yeah, Luke mentions that too. But the deadly superstition, though suppressed for a time, broke out again. Now, notice that Tacitus doesn't say anything about the resurrection of Jesus. He's not a believer. But this, this 
leader, Christus, put to death, but the superstition, what? Broke out again. Not only throughout Judea, here he gives the references to where it was happening. Is that what we know from the Gospel record? Yeah, Judea, that's where Jerusalem was. Where this evil had its origin. But also through the city of Rome also. This teaching, this following of the name, not only stayed in Judea, but it spread out and made it all the way to Rome. Now, some of you might say, well, he obviously doesn't believe in Jesus. Why do you want to read me about Tacitus saying that things about, about Christus? And the answer is because a powerful testimony is the testimony of someone who doesn't believe. He doesn't believe in Jesus. But notice he has to recognize that Jesus did exist and that Jesus and his followers had a profound impact upon the world. If you want to read some more about that, Josh McDowell has an excellent book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Page 84 of that book. Powerful little book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. Section C, Jewish authors. Jewish authors. So we've looked, A, at Christian authors, B, classical authors, and I've just given you Tacitus. You say, that's not too many. You're right. Section C, Jewish authors. And I want to focus on two here, one and two under Section C. First, a, a very famous Jewish author that to many of you may have heard of by the name of Josephus. How many of you have heard of Josephus? Okay, you may not have read any of his work. Spelt like Joseph with a U.S., Josephus. But a famous Jewish historian, and again, you might say, well, there must be a lot in Josephus about Jesus the Christ. And the answer is no, but there is a reference. And it's been hotly debated, especially by Jewish scholars who would like to suggest it's not authentic. And uh, perhaps you would uh, recognize why they would not want it there. However, it is found in all of the... Ex- existing manuscripts of Josephus' work. Every one has this in it, which would point towards its reliability, that it's in every one, not just one of them that they found somewhere. And here's the reference. Now, I want you to listen carefully. Remember, Tacitus didn't say anything about the resurrection or about Jesus being the Son of God or anything like that. He just said Christus put to death in the time of Pontius Pilate in Judea, right? Notice some essential differences in Josephus' testimony. This is from Josephus' Antiquities, uh, volume 18. Now, about this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of men who received the truth with pleasure, And he drew many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. Okay, he was a good teacher. Many of the Jews and Gentiles followed him. But notice what he says next. He was the Christ. Whoa. That's that's identifying him as Messiah. And when Pilate, at the information of the leading men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those who had loved him at first did not cease to do so. For he appeared to them, don't miss this, he appeared to them alive again the third day. What's that talking about? The resurrection. As the divine prophets had foretold. Remember we were back over there in the Old Testament prophets? This and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct to this day. That's an interesting term, the tribe of Christians. Not extinct to this day. They're still there, still believing. Now, you might read that and say, whoa, was Josephus a Christian? And the answer is, I don't know. Is it possible to know and say, you know, Jesus, I I think Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world and still not accept him personally. Is that possible? Sure, there's tons of people that do that, right? Satan believes that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, 
He doesn't accept him personally, does he? So we don't know about Josephus, though it's very interesting that right before the fall of Rome in 70 AD, that Josephus, who was over the uh, Jewish armies in Galilee, defected to the Romans. I wonder if he believed the prophecy of Jesus, remember? About not one stone standing. I wonder if he believed the prophecy of Jesus. I don't know. I guess we'll find that out when we get there. But certainly, I want you to notice one thing. At least, key contribution of Josephus, different from Tacitus, talks about the resurrection, and he also talks about the fact that Jesus was condemned to death, how? On a cross. Okay? Does that tie in with what we know from gospel history? Absolutely. All right. Our last uh, reference under Jewish authors... And then I want to conclude with a section about the trustworthiness of the gospel record. Is the Talmuds. Now these Talmuds, the writing of the rabbis, these commentaries of the rabbis, while clearly hostile, and they are hostile toward Jesus, they do harmonize with what we know in the gospels. Okay? They're negative. You say, well, why do we want to read them if they're negative? Well, you don't criticize someone that didn't exist, right? Someone comes in, I don't like, you know, Saddam Hussein, or I don't like the President of the United States, or I don't like, you know, whoever. You know, you don't fight against and write about someone if they don't exist. That's not logical. So these are negative, but they are a historical witness. They are useful for us as we tie them in with what we know from gospel history. Here's a few of the things that uh, the Talmuds uh, record. His name was Yeshua of Nazareth, okay, Jesus. Son of an adulteress, what's that a reference to? Yeah, the miraculous uh, situation regarding his birth. He was not married. He was a virgin at the time of the conception. All right, practice sorcery, what's that a reference to? Miracles. Now listen, it's important. We're going to come to this in lecture 10. They couldn't deny the miracles were happening. They're like, oh, nothing happens. It's just a silly thing they're following him, but nothing happens. They couldn't deny that, so they had to try to explain it. And they explained it as sorcery. Beguiled and led Israel astray. That's what they said. He said that he was not come to take anything from the law or to add to it. Well, that's true. That's what Jesus said. He was hanged as a false teacher. What's that a reference to? Death on the cross. Notice his last one I noted. His disciples healed the sick in his name. Isn't that interesting? They don't believe in him. Negative testimony. But they cannot deny supernatural things are happening by his name. The disciples healed the sick. Well, we've looked, as we've noticed, gospel history is important because Christianity is not just based on teachings, but it's based on a person in history. No real history, no Christianity. And so we looked for some sources, and we looked at the biblical sources. We noticed the gospels as the primary inspired source. The Apostle Paul, these agrafa, these sayings not in the gospels, and the Old Testament prophecies. Then we looked at the non-inspired sources, or sources outside the Bible, Christian authors like the Church Fathers and the Apocryphal Gospels, classical authors and Jewish authors. But I'd like to conclude this lecture with Major Section 3 and talk to you about the trustworthiness of the Gospel record, because we are going to be spending our time primarily with the Gospel record. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So let's look at the trustworthiness of the gospel record. And I want to suggest to you here, in a brief overview, several reasons why we can trust the gospel record as reliable. Okay? Subsection A, under this third section, I've entitled Authentic Palestinian Background. 
authentic Palestinian background. As you come to a document and you say, well, is this reliable? Was it written in Palestine uh, uh, about the time that Jesus is supposed to have lived? Under the time of Herod and his sons? There are several things that you could do looking at a document. Even if you gave this to a to an atheist, or to someone that didn't believe in Christ, and say, okay, does this look like a first century AD, as we call it, document in Palestine? What are some of the things you'd look for in the text to, to authenticate it? What bits of information might you look for? Okay, stuff, if there's any kind of dating, any kind of political things about rulers, uh, information about the climate, cities that are mentioned, right? cultural things, uh, religious festivals. Are you with me? If you look at all these things, you can jot just a few of those down, but, you know, the culture, the climate, the geography, those are things that uh, the political situation, the religious practices. You ought to be able to give this book to an expert on Palestinian history at that time, culture, and they'd say, yep, this fits, or no, you're talking about Something as simple as someone writing a book today and saying, oh, and in the valley is a beautiful dairy farm. And you're like, all I can see is a parking lot. You know, I don't think this was written in the year 2000. Not authentic. Check it out. See if it fits. Scholars, as they check the gospel record, find an authentic Palestinian background. Okay. Some even say, people like John's gospel say, is the man knows the area like a tour guide. You know, I mean... We discover things that we didn't know based on the gospel record. Secondly, and I think perhaps even more important than the authentic Palestinian background, the second reason why we can trust the reliability of the gospel record is the picture of Christ presented. What kind of picture of Christ do we find in the gospels? You say, I don't know, I've got to read one of them today, so I'm I'm not really sure. But I will tell you right now that it is not the typical picture that the Jews expected. The Jews were expecting a Messiah, but not a Messiah that looked like this. What kind of Messiah were they expecting? Anybody else? Right, a military ruler, throw over the Romans, reestablish the kingdom, sword in his right hand, you know. The picture of Christ in the Gospels is the exact opposite of that. He, he says if a soldier asks you to go one mile, go two miles. He, he, he says you should not only love your neighbor, but love your enemy. Pray for those who hurt you. And they're like, what? Kill those who hurt you. He is not the Messiah they're looking for. But as you study these Old Testament prophecies, he is the exact fulfillment. He is the Messiah that's promised. So if I was just making this book up, trying to get people to believe in a liberator and follow him, I sure wouldn't paint a picture of Christ that we find in the Gospels. They'd be saying, no, 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 don't, don't give us someone like that. And yet this is indeed what the prophets foretold. Picture of Christ, exact opposite of what they were expecting, and yet a complete fulfillment of what the prophets told. Thirdly, section C. Not only the authentic Palestinian background and the picture of Christ presented give us uh, evidence of the trustworthiness of the gospel record, but section C, the independence of the accounts. The independence of the accounts. It becomes obvious, even though there are some parallels, particularly in the synoptics, and we'll talk about that in lecture two, that they're not identical. We we don't just have one gospel, we have four. And even in the synoptic gospels, there are differences. You read it, particularly in things like the resurrection. One person, one angel, two angels, one of them has Mary in the garden, others don't mention that. You go, wow, can't they get the story straight? Even the order of the temptations in Matthew, the way most of us have learned it, stones into bread and 
and then the pinnacle of the temple, and then bow down on the mountain. And, you know, Luke has it another way. Well, the inscription over the cross, there's some variations in exactly how that was worded. You go, wow, how is that? And, and people say, well, I guess it's not reliable then. Ah, I want to suggest to you that the, this variation of independence in the accounts actually adds reliability. Because the people are standing in a different perspective. How many of you here have ever had a car accident? Okay. Confession time. Okay. Well, I want to tell you, if you try to find witnesses, it is very difficult to have them with exactly the same story. Someone said, well, yeah, you saw it. No, no, he indicated. I saw I was standing over here, and no, I didn't see him indicate at all. Well, where were you standing? Well, I was standing behind that tree over there. Oh, well, no wonder you didn't see him. If you were to take that to court, and all of the witnesses were to stand there and say exactly the same thing, what would the judge think? Yeah, they, she'd say, well, that doesn't sound very reliable to me. Because weren't you standing over there behind the tree? Yeah. Well, how could you see the indicator? Whoa, whoa. through the tree? You know, I mean... <laughs> the fact that they're standing in different perspectives means that they see things and even their, their own thinking, you know. You imagine Luke as the physician and you know, Matthew, former tax collector. They see things from a different perspective and they don't write it all down. The fact that there's variation, to me, adds reliability rather than drawing away from it. Okay? All right, section D, we'll look at two more as we conclude this first lecture. Section D, the number of manuscripts. If you just had one manuscript of the Gospels, it certainly would not be difficult to modify that. I guess if you were good at calligraphy, you could try to reproduce and you might even try to age the papyrus or whatever you were writing on and change some things. But when you have a widespread tradition, where you've got many manuscripts, Scholars say that there is about 5,500 copies of all or part of the New Testament in existence. 5,500. There are more than 1,400, and that's a number I want you to write down. There are 1,400 Greek manuscripts of the Gospels. 1,400 of them. About 40 of them are more than 1,000 years old. Of the 1,400 gospel manuscripts we have, the manuscripts containing the gospel record, about 40 of them are more than 1,000 years old. No, we don't have the originals, you know, signed John, you know, whatever. We don't have the originals, but we have many manuscripts. And that's, that's quite apart from all of the manuscripts that have been translated into many other different languages, early languages. The, the possibility of changing all of that it just becomes very, very remote. And you've heard of sometimes a variant reading. This word is different here. There's, we're not talking about these seven books aren't in this one. This word maybe could have been this or that, or this phrase is missing from this early manuscript. But there is enough to give us a reliable testimony on which to build our faith in who Jesus is. So the number of manuscripts, 1,400, 40 that are over 1,000 years old, gives us evidence of its reliability as a record. But I want to suggest Section E is the most powerful evidence. The most powerful evidence of the trustworthiness of the Gospel record is the personal experience of the founders of the church. The personal experience. Of the apostles the founders of the church. You see, the Gospels are the product of individuals who seriously questioned whether Jesus would ever come back. We thought he was the one who was going to deliver Israel. They were locked up for fear of the Jews. But when they see Jesus raised from the dead, 
when they eat with him, when they touch him, when they listen to him explain the scriptures, all of the things of the Old Testament that were fulfilled in his life and about what is to come. Listen now. They are all so thoroughly convinced that he is indeed the Christ that they're willing to lay down their lives for that conviction. Because they know that Jesus has conquered death in his resurrection. And so they go out and say, Jesus is the Christ, he's raised from the dead. These people who were called fools and slow of heart to believe are so convinced, the evidence is so compelling that they're willing to lay down their lives. Now let me ask you a question. Would you be willing to die for something that you didn't believe in? Let's pray. Holy Father, as we've begun our journey looking at the life and teachings of Jesus, we've considered a study of the Gospels, of Gospel history. And we've seen how important Gospel history is. And the testimony that Jesus really existed and he had much to say in his life and in his teachings. And I pray that as we take an intelligent look, that we might discover the truth, not only about who Jesus was, but about what he wants to do for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. This special presentation has been brought to you by American Cassette Ministries. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International Copyright 2000, American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. For additional cassettes by this speaker or for a free catalog of other American Cassette Ministry cassettes, please contact us as follows. To order toll free in the United States and Canada, dial 1-800-233-4450. For international calls, dial 717-652-7000. For fax orders, dial 1-717-652-9050. Our internet email address is info at americancassette.org. Our entire current catalog plus many other items are available online from our secure website, www.americancassette.org. We accept MasterCard, Visa, and Discover Card. Or you may simply write to American Cassette Ministries, Post Office Box 922, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 17108 in the United States of America. Answering the heart cry of the faithful for 25 years, American Cassette Ministries requests your continued praise and financial support as we strive to provide you with the finest, most powerful spiritual messages available. Our one purpose in ministry is to prepare you and your loved ones to meet Jesus Christ. Peace and peace.